<laughs> Online folks, how you doing? Can't see me yet, I don't think, but there I am. <laughs> Good to see everybody this morning. We just want to welcome the Holy Spirit, welcome the King of Kings, welcome the Son. Lord, we just come here to be in your presence, to be with you, just to, I don't know, revel, that's a good word, revel, revel in your goodness. We just want to experience your kindness. We want to love each other and love you this morning well, so... Just, Lord, we pray that you would just uh, be kind to us this morning as you're only able to do. Just show us your love. Show us your affection. Father, we're coming into your throne room this morning. We just want to rise above the clouds and be in your presence. Rest at your feet. Just cast our crowns down before you. We welcome you, Jesus. All throughout my history, your faithfulness is one. Storms made way 
Thank you, Jesus.
generation to the next. Speak your blood, we speak your name. Over generations and generations, we speak your peace. back into those habits of what my family, what my mom, what my, you know, but I know that we got to stand and take a different path. And while I was doing that, it's been a lot this year for me, a lot. This year of transformation, it's beating me up, <laughs> but in a good way. Um, but I did realize that as I was sitting there focusing on the fight, fighting, 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 I realized that I was focused on myself. God hasn't left me, but my 
my focus was including him in, in my fight when I needed him, but also excluding him when I was focused on myself because I was the one doing the fighting. So he spoke to me and helped me realize that that's a little, you know, lovingly that that was like a prideful thing inside of me. That when I tend to focus because I'm fighting, because I'm the one doing the work, that was my pride was pulling away from my focus on him, which was making me more vulnerable to other things. So I had to step back and include him and draw closer to him rather than far away because I'm focused on me doing the work. I don't know if that makes sense, but I just want to say that I feel like God's here with all of us. There's a lot of people that I look out and we are fighting. There's a lot of fight happening lately. And he's with us. And I just want to remind us to step closer to him. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's, there's so many things to do. You're exhausted. But he's here. He's here. He's going to give you strength. He's going to meet with you.
Spirit, come, wash over us. Come, bring your peace. Come, bring your rest. Come, bring the wonder of you. Come, be our King. Be our friend, come be the wonder of it all. Come be the wonder of it Be the wonder of it all. Come be our king. Come be our friend. Come be the wonder of it all. Come be our peace. Come be our rest. Come be the Amen. Some little sneaky bugger shut our TV off back there while we're. <laughs> Which is why we were standing like this. Catherine. <laughs> hey, she is. I'm okay with it. We forgive her. That's why we just look like. Princess. That's why we looked befuddled for a minute if you were curious. Yeah, that's why we were like. You guys were all having a good time though, so we just. Uh, I looked out at you guys, and you guys didn't even know this problem. Worked out. <laughs> All right, yeah. What a deal, huh? Well, I guess we could have elevated desks. That would be a possibility. All right, well, God's good, and as usual, I got to run over here. Yeah. I got to get a hold of this for some reason. We teach out of the Bible. It's because it's the Word of God. We must live by what it says, that's for sure. Well, this morning, Pastor Suzette happens to be in um, Austin, Minnesota area, Brownsville, which is just a little dinky place outside of there. Uh, it's her brother's 70th birthday, and so doing the decade thing. And, you know, if, if you've been around for a while, you know Suzette does a big shindig every... She throws one for herself. And she picks the themes because she doesn't want black balloons and all that jazz. But I would never do that anyway. I'm not that kind of a person. I refuse to do that. Um, we, when we ripen with age, it's a good thing. Because we're another decade in the Lord and we're growing in His grace and His mercy. So... So this morning, I just wanted to uh, remind us that we are going to be starting October 24th, the School of Kingdom Ministry, and it's called the Greater Grand Forks because I've been working with about five other churches that showed interest, and hopefully we'll be sending people to this school. 
And the idea behind the school is that what we will do is learn how to be naturally supernatural people. You know, it, God moves through normal, natural people. And we do normal, natural things. And he does the miracles, the signs, and the wonders. We just cooperate with him. I always love it how it put it in the book of Acts. You know, they're praying. Remember, um, uh, they healed the guy at the gate, beautiful. It said, in the name of Jesus Christ, Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he was walking and leaping and praising God. They threw him in jail. Uh, they threatened them. And then they had a prayer meeting. And they said, Lord, give us confidence to speak your word while you exalt your hand and heal in signs and wonders. So that's the whole thing. We are natural. He's supernatural. We do what we can do, which is pray, proclaim, uh, have faith, trust, believe, all the different things, but he releases his power, his majesty. And I think if you look in, in the book of Mark at the very end, very last verses, it says that they went out and they proclaimed the gospel and signs and wonders followed because signs and wonders follow the proclamation of the gospel that Christ is here to break in. And actually, that kingdom... Uh, it's, it's in the scripture a lot in the New Testament. So we thank you, Lord, for this kingdom. So it's going to start October 24th. Got to register by uh, October 9th so we can get the materials here. It's going to be every Monday night from 6 to 9. And we have three basic things we do. One hour of teaching, one hour of what we call impartation, where we teach a lesson of, of something how to hear the voice of God, how to prophesy, how to do these different things because Scripture says we can all prophesy one by one. So we're going to be teaching this, telling why we want to do this, uh, and then demonstrating it, and then we'll also participate. That's the third aspect of it, is we participate and actually put it into practice because it's my, my personal belief is belief is not enough. Belief is never enough. Belief should cause a response. Yeah, the demons believe and tremble, but they don't respond in the correct way. But when, when the gospel calls us, true faith means we have works. We heard that in that James that, that we listened to. He says, I'll show you my faith by my works. And so we have to do the things that God calls us to do, and that's exciting. So that's coming up, and uh, we're going to go for it. Well, this morning we want to give an opportunity to give to the Lord because we believe that's part of our worship. Part of our worship. You know, when the Lord, I know there are those, I always get a kick out of this because they want to be free they say, well, you know, the Bible says, uh, you know, that, that tithing's of the law. And if you look at the scripture, tithing was from the beginning. Abraham tithed hundreds of years before the law. He tithed. And uh, so did Jacob. And so tithing is a principle that, Lord, you are the Lord of heaven and earth. And so we give to him that tithe as a thing of trust, as a thing of faith that you're my provider, as a thing of worship, as a thing of praise, as a thing of honor. And we have to understand that uh, that's just a biblical principle that came into effect before the law. And so, Lord, we thank you that we can give to you today for your honor and for your glory. And that, Lord, it says that you love a joyful heart. So may we give it with thanksgiving that you are the one who meets all of our needs according to your riches and glory. Amen? All right. Well, let's do it. <clears throat> well, it's interesting how, how the 
Lord. Let's see, we need to release some bigger kids and then some littler kids. So let's go. We'll release you guys to go to children's church and youth group and have a great time. You know, the Bible's pretty big. It has lots of stuff in here, and so sometimes you go, Lord, what do you want to say? What do you want to do? I know there are people who, who plan out their preaching schedule a year in advance, and I can never do that. I, I can't. I just, I just can't because um, I've tried it before, and then I sense the Lord change directions, and I want to try to follow what the Lord has to say, so that really becomes an important part. I think of even our walk with him is that we're, we're not the ones who are in charge. He's the one who is leading us. Because if you look at what the scripture says, Jesus said, follow me. That means we're looking to where he's going and trying to, to walk with him and let him take the lead. So today I want to talk about being like Jesus. And when we talk about this, I think there's, an, there's a thing that happens in our brains to say, I can never be like Jesus. But the Bible tells us to be like Jesus. <laughs> it tells us to do it. And we're going to look at some passage of Scripture and where it says that we're to come up to the fullness of Christ, that we're being transformed into the image of of Christ, that we're to follow Christ in the ways that he leads us. All these things, we're to be like Jesus. We're to be like Jesus, and I want to talk about it in three different ways. First of all, we're to be like him in our being. In other words, well, we'll read it here in a minute. In our being, in our thought, and in our actions, we're to be like Jesus. And if the scripture says that's what we're moving toward, and that's the goal of our lives, then we can do it because we have the help of the Holy Spirit. And I think Lena said some, some good stuff, you know, this morning. She says she was fighting in her own strength, and of course that doesn't work. It makes you tired, exhausted, and and it's not as effective, obviously, because the power of God going forth from us is what really does it. So we need to be like Jesus in our being, in our thought, and in our actions. And so we're going to look at these three. Well, we're going to start where we need to start at the beginning. <laughs> uh, so let, we're going to go to the book of Genesis, chapter 1 and chapter 2. We're going to look at some of the things that the scripture says. So Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, and over all the earth over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So when we see this, it says it multiple times. Let's make man in our image and in our likeness. Now we know that obviously we're created beings, and so 
we don't have the same essence of who God is because God's the uncreated one. He's the eternal one. But he says, let us make man in our image. And so he has a concept and an idea of what man is supposed to be. And he said he created them male and female. So the image of God isn't just locked in to the male or the female, but the wholeness of the male and the female because it's right here very clear in the scripture and it says that um, he gave them authority to rule and to reign Genesis 2 7 says this it's giving us a different picture now see in when we look in Genesis chapter 1 we get the, the the idea that both of them were there right away Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 says then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now, out of all creation, God spoke everything into existence, but he formed the man from the clay, from the dust of the earth, and it says he breathed into his nostrils life, the spirit. That's ruach. He, he breathed life into them, and man became a living being. And it says in verse 15, it says, Then the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and to keep it. And some people think, well, you know, that he's just keeping a garden. To keep means to watch over, to guard. He was to be in charge of that section and we know from the other passages that God said, you're going to ultimately subdue the whole earth. That was his plan, that Adam and his children, the fruitfulness of his, of, of his loins and Eve's womb would grow and increase and fill the whole earth. And so there was no, uh, there was no help meet for Adam. God had him go and name all the animals, and he found none of nothing among them. And so it says in verse 21, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to man. And then he said, this is flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. And it says, therefore, you know, the man and the woman will leave and be joined together and become one flesh. But one of the things that these passages of Scripture say is that man was created to have dominion over the earth. It's very clear in multiple scriptures. He says they're going to rule. He says they're going to keep, which is to watch over, to guard. He says um, that there are to fill the earth, to subdue it. That means to make it subservient. To rule, which means dominion, dominate, make subservient. To keep means to watch over, preserve, and guard. So God has given man authority from himself over this earth. And so there is this idea of dominion. And then he said, be fruitful and multiply. So God gives them three things, this dominion, fruitfulness, because he wants them to expand into the fullness of what he has for them, and multiplication, which is children, so that they can fill the earth and subdue it and bring this dominion about. And so we see this is that this is what God has desired for them to do, for them to walk with him, to be um, over the earth. And God's the one who gave them that dominion. But we know the fall happened, and we know what happened with that is that the whole world came under the power of the evil one. Because man gave up his dominion by rebelling against God and listening to the serpent, listening to Satan, what happened is they became under Satan's rule. And we see it in the New Testament, how it talks about in Colossians that when we're saved, 
were born again and were taken out of the kingdom of darkness or the domain of darkness and were brought into the light. And it says that, that the enemy had us as slaves and that we were slaves to sin and that we were slaves to death. We had the fear of death and Jesus came to deliver us from that. And so we see that because of this shift there has been a change that's taken place in man. And the image of God isn't totally, absolutely destroyed. But one of the things that you have to think about, and is very interesting, and I don't think a lot of people um, talk about this because they're, they're so concerned about, um, you know, just the sinfulness and the rottenness of man. But man is spiritually dead. They're spiritually dead and they need life. And Jesus came that we might have life and life more abundantly. And so what he says that he talks about it, he says in John chapter 3, don't you know you need to be born again? You need to be born of the Spirit. And of course, uh, Nicodemus was thinking, well, can I go back into the womb? He was thinking natural things. He says, you're a leader, a ruler of Israel. You don't even understand these simple things. Because we're spiritually dead, we have to come alive. And that's why we need to be born again from above. That's why we need to become that new creation that it talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're new creatures in Christ. We're a new creation in him because he makes us alive. And now we can begin to enter into this second part of what takes place. Because of man's fall, it brought destruction, but Jesus came to restore all things. Jesus came to right things, to bring his kingdom, his power, his rule, his authority into our lives. And so uh, we're going to look at a couple of different passages in Colossians chapter 1. Verses 28 and 29. So we proclaim him, Jesus. <laughs> we proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. That's what the goal is, for us to be complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power which mightily works within me. So I find it interesting. Paul talks about this in a lot of different places. He's striving. He's, he says, I am like a mother in birth labor pains over you until Christ is formed in you. And so he's praying for the church. He's asking. He's, he's seeing that the goal is for us to be like Jesus, complete in him. So Jesus came to restore what was lost through the fall. And so when it says complete in him, I do believe it means complete. That's what the goal is. And so when we look at 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18, which is one of the verses that we had for our theme this year of transformation, 3.17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. And so he says some 
powerful things here. He says that as we look at the Lord, because we're beholding him in a mirror, as we're beholding the Lord, as we fix our gaze upon him, we are being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. You remember that this word be transformed, when it says that, that it's in the passive in, in the Greek, which means it's being done to us. It's not in the active, which is us doing it, but it's the spirit of God as we look upon Jesus, as we look at him as our source, that's when we begin to be transformed because we're looking at the glory of the Lord. We're looking at who he says we are to be. We're, we're looking to him to, to move in our lives, to change us, to transform us, and to do the things that need to be done. And so it's the spirit of God that actually begins that process within us and so it says, from glory to glory, he's doing it. And so that tells me that it's progressive. That also tells me that it's stage by stage. But the whole thing is, is he has a purpose for us to move on to maturity. And that maturity is one person, Jesus, because we're to be like him. It says we're being transformed into his image, and Paul said the other one, to be complete in Christ. And so there is this powerful thing that we're to be like Jesus. Now, there are a lot of authors, because I've read so many books and I've taught so many courses and all this kind of stuff, that like to focus on our being. Who are we? Who are we? Just us by ourselves apart from all the works or anything else that we do, who are we? The Bible talks about that we're sons and daughters of God. So that's a relationship. We're sons and daughters, but we've been born again, so there's something of the Spirit of God within us, and it talks about it in Second Peter, that we are partakers of, of the divine nature. We're not gods in the sense of there's only one God, the uncreated one, but he has his spirit within us. And we partake of that. We are partakers of his divine nature. And so there's life in us that can't be snuffed out, that can't be taken it says, do not fear him who can just kill the body, but fear him who can kill both the body and the soul and the spirit. We just have to understand that we have the very spirit of God within us that changes us, that transforms us, that makes us into his image. Becoming part of the image of God is never something that we are uh, able to do apart from the incredible grace and mercy and power of God. And so we become like him as we behold him. So in our being, we're to be like Jesus. We're to be like him because we're new creation. We are actually like him. A lot of times the problem is we don't believe it. And we don't walk it out. We don't live it. We live out of our pasts. We live out of our woundedness and brokenness. We live out of our own thoughts rather than God's thoughts. And that's why I always talk about us getting this word of God in here. And if we look at the word of God and we say, no, that's not for me, then we need to fix that because God's word's true for everyone, every single person. And so everyone who comes to Christ is a child of God, everyone, everyone on the same footing because of the spirit within us. So the first thing that we're to do is we're to be like Jesus and understand that recognize it, that we're not striving to become something we already are. Wouldn't it be crazy? 
you gave birth to a child? And they kept coming up. I, I wish you were my parents. I, I, just, I just don't feel like you're my parents. I just really wish you were. I just don't feel it. I just don't understand. I want you to be my parents. Well, we are your parents. Mom says, I gave birth to you. But we do it so often. We, I just don't feel like I'm what God says. And so we have to understand that, that our feelings can mislead us and that we already are sons. We already are daughters. We already have place in God's heart. We've already been reconciled to him. We already have been given, like it says in, in uh, John chapter 1, he has given us the right to become children of God. And so we enter into that. We are in Christ. When we come to him, we're in him. And we don't have to fight for that. It's already there. We just have to accept it and learn to walk it out and walk in it and not strive for something that we already have. Man, it can be tiring to strive for something you already have. Because you think you don't have it. And your focus goes on that. But God's already given us sonship. We're already sons. We're already daughters. So the next thing, we're to be like Jesus, complete in him, mature in him. Now we know it's a growing process because in the scripture it talks about us being babes in Christ, talks about young men, young women, talks about fathers in the faith. So there is a progression that takes place and that's to be expected because just as a baby doesn't come out and say, hey, I think I'll go fix the truck. Now they just lay there. They can't do anything. You have to do everything for them. But in the normal process, they grow and they mature and they become complete. They become mature and grow into what they are created to be. And so that is just an important thing for us to remember. So let's go to Ephesians 4 because there's a couple of concepts out of there. We're going to take the next two concepts out of, out of uh, this chapter in Ephesians 4. And I'm going to do it slightly out of order from what the Scripture says just because uh, how I want to present this. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And he, which is Jesus, gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Now listen. Until we all attain to the unity of faith and of a knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man. Again, here's this maturity, this growth, this stability of maturity to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. That is the example of maturity. It tells us what it is. The fullness of the stature of Christ. That's what it's talking about. Stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Then it says in verse 14, As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. For whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what each joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body 
for the building up of itself in love. Man, there's so much in there. It's just massively filled with information. But the second thing is that we're to think like Jesus. We see a couple of aspects of Jesus is that when he was confronted by the devil, tempted by the devil in the wilderness, that he used the word of God. He responded with what God said. He knew the word of God. And so he responded out of that. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but the devil used the word of God against Jesus. He used one of the Psalms, and he says, hey, he'll give his angels charge over you. Jump off of this, and they won't let your feet hit the ground. You won't be harmed. And so Jesus says, it says, thou shall not tempt the Lord your God. Because he needs to be directed by the Spirit of God. And so even the devil will take the word of God and twist it for his purposes. That's why we need to know the word of God. And not just take one verse and make that the context. We need to fit all of the words that we have into the fullness of the scripture. Because that's where we get wrong is when we take one thing, it says it right there. God will protect you. Go ahead. God will protect you. It says it in the Bible. But then it also says, and what's the spirit behind that? Of course, he's tempting Jesus to do something that will force God to protect him. And so he goes, no, I'm not going to tempt the Lord my God. And so he has an understanding of the fullness of Scripture, and we have to do that because what it seems to me is many times what happens is that in order to have some of the doctrines that we have around here, you know, in our world, is we have to forget other passages of Scripture. We take the ones we want, we pull them out, we highlight them, but we ignore or talk away the other passages. We have to bring all of them into balance because the Word of God is truth and the Word of God is, is con- interconnected because the Spirit of God is the one who breathed on this work, the one who moved the hearts of men to write the words that we have received. So we have to understand that. And so we're to think like Jesus we're, we're to think with the Word of God and take that Word of God and let that direct us. And that's what it talks about in Ephesians, doesn't it? It says, don't be children tossed around by every wind and every doctrine. Man, that happens in Christianity. They're fads. And there's some truth to it. But any truth overemphasized gets pulled out of the context. You can, we can overblow up any portion of the Scripture, and then it loses its balance. Scripture is very balanced in what it presents. And so we have to have all of them together. You know, I've talked about this before. I always get a kick out of it. I've had people look me in the face and say, you know what? I'd rather have the fruit of the Spirit than the gifts of the Spirit. I said, well, that's kind of funny. Why wouldn't you want both? Who said you had to pick? Well, you know, some of those people who have the gifts of the Spirit, they're so flaky and they're so fruity. I just want to have the the fruit of the Spirit. I said, well, God wants you to have both. He wants you to have both. It's all of the Spirit. Because someone does something goofy like the Corinthians where they need to be corrected doesn't mean that what God has for us, fruit of the Spirit, gifts of the Spirit, same Spirit. And so I want it all. And hopefully learn to do it in His Spirit, right? 
and not in the flesh because we can do a lot of things in the flesh. It, it happens. And that's why some people are afraid. So what we have to do is take this word of God. And here is, I don't know, I have certain passages that I read all the time because I, they're just important. And one of them is in Philippians chapter 2. So if you just flip, a, flip to Philippians, this is the thing. We need to think like Jesus. And this is what it says. Paul's saying in verse 5, he says, Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. So this is the thinking, and this is the response of the heart. He's saying, I want you to have the same attitude, the same thought, the same heart as Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And for this reason also God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We looked at this in a sermon a ways back, but we, we found that when we do what God calls us to do, we bring glory to God. That's how you can glorify God. How can I glorify one who is magnified so high? We glorify God by walking in obedience to his call. And so this is kind of interesting when we look at this. It talks about Jesus, first of all, Existed in the form of God, but he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He wasn't looking for his own glory. He wasn't looking for position. He wasn't looking for power. He wasn't looking for anything but to glorify God. And it says he emptied himself. This idea of Jesus coming, he actually, when he came, he emptied himself and fully refused to move on his own authority and power. It says it in the scripture, I only do what I see the Father doing. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to do the things. Every miracle Jesus did was through the power of the Holy Spirit, not through his own power. He humbled himself. He emptied himself. He refused because he needed to. Because if he came and used his power as God, then that would leave us behind. But he came as a man, it says, emptied himself. He's fully man, fully God. We don't, it's hard for us to get it. You know, we want scientific proof you're not going to get it. He emptied himself and became, took on a form of a bondservant. He came to serve the Father, and he came to serve us. And if you don't think that, you can say, Mark, Jesus said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He came to serve us as well as the Father. It's interesting. So he emptied himself. He became a bond servant, being made in the likeness of men. And it says he humbled himself. That's a huge humbling. He says he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Boy, does that ever take humility. He was mocked, he was scorned, he was beaten. 
They just, come on, get off the cross. You saved others, you can't even save yourself. They just mocked him and came, came against him. But it says he was obedient, even to the point of death. So God calls us, through Paul here, have the same attitude. Have the same attitude. Think like Jesus. Think like he thought. Not to exalt yourself, but to humble yourself, to become a bondservant. To give your life, even to the point of death if necessary. We never know. None of us know what's ahead. So to think like him. And then to act like him. That's the amazing one. So we're going to go back to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. He says there's these pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets, and apostles. Pretty cool, huh? He did, did them kind of backwards just for fun. But therefore, the equipping of the saints. Therefore, the equipping of everyone in the body of Christ for the work of service. To the building up of the body of Christ. I'm convinced that many of us don't understand how important we are to building up the body. Sometimes we feel insignificant. Sometimes we think, well, it doesn't matter if I'm there or not. I'm not preaching. I'm not teaching. But you know what? There's more than just even coming to church on Sunday. How do we build one another up? We build one another up by spending time together by encouraging, by doing the whatever there is. I think there's at least 30 different um, one another's, love one another, pray for one another, encourage one another, do all these different things. They're the one another's. And as we do that, we build each other up. And hopefully... Our faith is infectious, that it helps others, that you come into this place and as you look around, you might see someone and you might encourage them. You might speak a word into their life. You might even pray for someone after the service. You might speak life to them that will help them continue to press into the Lord and grow in his ways. And so that becomes an important thing. It's not just the ones who are like me preaching. It's us as we come together and minister to one another and build up one another. That's what we're talking about because it's talking about the work of service. We're serving the Lord and we're serving others. And we're helping the body to grow into a mature man because that's what it says. Um, building up the body of Christ, verse 12, until we attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. In all these things, Christ is our measuring stick. Christ is the one that we're becoming like. Christ is the one that, See, it's so easy. That's, that's, why, that's why the scripture says don't compare yourself to one another. We're not, you know, when we compare ourselves to one another, ooh, I know more scripture than them, so I'm holier. Ooh, I don't do this, but they do. Ooh, look at me. Jesus is the only one we look at. And Jesus is the only one we place our life against. And as we look to him, we're being transformed. And renewed. So just, just recognize that fact that, that we're to be like him. 
We're to grow into maturity. And we're to help others do the very same thing. And so, if we have the same attitude of Jesus, that means we have to do things. Jesus didn't just have an attitude, a good attitude, and sit there. What did it say? Total submission to God. He totally, absolutely submitted himself to the Father. John says it over and over and over in different ways, but he says, I only do what I hear the Father doing. I only say, I only do what I see him do, and I only say what I hear him say. And so he's showing that he is under submission. And we know he's under submission because in the garden, where he's, he's dripping blood because of the pressure that he's under, because he knows he's going to the cross. He asks three times, please, God, if there's any other way. But then he always says, not my will, but yours be done. And so he totally submits and yields himself. So that means his actions are driven, and we're to have the same heart same attitude, and the same actions. Of course, we're not going to die on the cross. But it says pick up the cross. You might have to crucify some flesh. Total submission to God. He didn't strive for position, but he emptied himself. He became a bondservant. He humbled himself even to the point of death. And for us to do the same thing, Think of others as more important than yourself. So, Lord, we just thank you for your word and thank you that we are yours. If we know you, we're sons and daughters. We have this position. It's not something that we strive for. We have this relationship with you because of the blood of Jesus. He's reconciled us to you. He's given us the privilege, the right to become sons and daughters. So we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you that we have the mind of Christ also. talks about in the scripture. Where we have your example shown very clearly to us of your heart and your attitude. And then the actions, Lord. We can do the things you ask us to do. We can fulfill your purpose. We can glorify you by doing what you ask. So we thank you for that. Now, I was thinking as I prayed that first part about us being sons and daughters, the only way that we can become a son or daughter is if we accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and that we are born again. I talked about that earlier. And so what we need to do is know who Christ is. We have to come to him. We have to humble ourselves, and we have to say yes to him. We have to confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is the Lord and God has raised him from the dead. And his blood covers all of our sin and restores us into a relationship with the Father. And that's the only way we can do it. And so pretty much everyone in this room, I know you've responded to Christ. And so if there's any that are listening over the web and you're listening and you're finding this and you're just sensing God calling you and drawing you to himself, I want you to submit your heart to him today. I want you to yield to him. I want you to say yes to him because he's calling you to himself. But you have to acknowledge your sin. You have to acknowledge that you've rejected God and gone your own way. And now you're coming to him and his way. So let's just pray this together. Dear Lord, I choose today 
to surrender my heart to you, to make you Lord of my life. I recognize that you died for my sin, and the only way I can be cleansed is through your sacrifice on the cross. Your blood forgives my sins and restores me back to God. And so I accept your sacrifice. And I desire to be born again. And so I recognize that you rose again from the dead so that I could have life. And your resurrection is my guarantee of resurrection life. And so I put my trust in you, and I choose to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. That's amazing stuff. It's good stuff. It's the Bible. So we have to go for it. We have to press into it. We have to believe it. We have to understand who we are in Christ and great position and place that he gives us. All right. Well, light your hair and fire. And if you need prayer, would like prayer for any purpose, then we'll be happy to do it. So God bless you. Have an awesome day.